you know that the CEO of Google, Sundar Pichai, was born in India? And do you know that the CEO of Microsoft, Satya Nadella, was also born in India? And guess where the CEO of Adobe was born? That's right, you guessed it, Santanu Narayan was born in India too. Say it loud! Say it proud. India is taking over Silicon Valley. In fact, you could say India is taking over the software industry worldwide. For example, what is the biggest IT services company? You might think of Accenture, right? You guessed wrong. It's TCS, an Indian company. And yes, I know what you're thinking right now. India? Isn't it a developing country? That is indeed true. Two thirds of Indians live below the poverty line and 73 million citizens live in extreme poverty. 68 million people live in slums and only 8.15% of Indians are college educated compared to 34% of US citizens who have had college degrees. In fact, 25% of Indians are not even literate. Nevertheless, we can say there are two Indias. There is the poor India that we know about and within that, there is tech India. If that was a country on its own, it would be a country as wealthy as Germany. Its GDP would be 177 billion US dollars and its population would be the 4 million people directly employed by it. Just four companies, TCS, Infosys, HCL, and Wipro hire over a million employees. By the way, these four companies were all born in India. If you happen to work in the IT industry, I'm sure you've worked with Indians at some point. There is almost no company on this planet that hasn't outsourced some service to India. And Indian software programmers are so appreciated that many fly to Silicon Valley, ending up in top positions like CEO. Now, I know your head is about to explode with so many questions. How did such a poor country with so many educational problems become the largest, actually the second largest, software exporter worldwide? Today we're going to answer this question, but before we do, as always, let's take a look back at some history. Right idea, wrong path. Many of you might associate India with Mahatma Gandhi, but the truth is that Gandhi was assassinated in 1948, before India even passed its constitution. In fact, one of the most important figures in India's history is not Gandhi or at least not the Gandhi that you studied at school. In fact, our story starts with Jawaharlal Nehru. First Prime Minister of India. Under his government, India adopted its constitution and became an independent country in its own right. But Nehru had a clear mission. He wanted to turn the former British colony into a pioneer in computer manufacturing. Back then, computers were just becoming a thing, and there was a window of opportunity for a newcomer to compete with the West. The question was, how do you do that? Instead of following the British model, Nehru took inspiration from Stalin's playbook. This is not to say India became a communist country, but they did take many communist elements, two in particular, five-year planning and banning imports. Yes, the way India wanted to nurture local industries was by protecting them from local competitors. This is how national behemoths were created, nurtured by the state. The most important one is India's most famous conglomerate. Tata. Yes, you might know Tata for their cars, but they also launched India's first airline and the first Indian computing company, Tata Computer Services, or TCS. At the same time, the government invested heavily in education. This is how, in the 1960s, India built lots of technology universities all across the country. These are the so-called Indian Institutes of Technology, or IITs. All of a sudden, lots of young Indians were fully prepared to work in the emerging computer industry. The problem? There were no companies to work for. Aside from Tata, almost no local companies had been created. Having banned most of the technological imports, local manufacturers couldn't find things like quality wires or sockets. So in the 1970s, India had only around 150 computers across the entire country, and those were imported by IBM, who had managed to bypass the already heavy regulations of the Indian market. This is the moment where the second protagonist of our history comes into the picture, Gandhi. But no, we are not talking about the Gandhi that you know. We are talking about Indira Gandhi, Prime Minister of India during the 60s and the 70s. And no, she was not the daughter of Mahatma, nor did she have any family connection with him. In fact, she was the daughter of the first protagonist, Mr. Nehru. Indira Gandhi realized that the only computers in India were imported by a foreign company. So what did she do? Following her father's logic, she said, a foreign company has made it into our market. No way. This means our regulations are not strict enough. So in 1973, she passed the foreign Exchange Regulation Act, making computer imports almost impossible. 
The outcome was that IBM withdrew from the Indian market that very same year. And now you might think, oh, that would be good news for the local manufacturers. Now they had free reign, didn't they? The opposite was true. Computers disappeared from the country. In the end, that window of opportunity was closed. And the rest of the world was already too busy buying US or Japanese computers. But things changed in 1982. Let's have a look. Learning from their mistakes. 1982 is remembered in India as the year when the country hosted the Asian Games. Something like the Olympics, but just for Asia. The organizer of these games was none other than, again, Gandhi. But this time it wasn't the Gandhi that you know, nor the one that you just met. This time, it was Rajiv Gandhi. Again, he had no family ties with Mahatma, but he was the son of Indira Gandhi. As you can see, this Indian story is pretty much a family business. But this Gandhi was very different from his mother. He really understood technology and wanted to use computers for the Asian games. Computers for the game schedules, records, results, announcements, etc. And this is when he realized the whole country had almost no computers. This was a whole epiphany for him. So as soon as he became the prime minister, he made a 180 degree shift in India's industrial policy. The first thing he did as soon as he took office was to remove, from one day to the next, all the tariffs and bans on imports. All of a sudden, computers could be imported duty-free, as long as they were used for developing software. Because tech-savvy as this Gandhi was, he knew it was too late to become a leader in computer manufacturing. But there was still a window of opportunity to jump into the next revolution, the software revolution. And oh boy, the outcomes of these new policies had immediate effects. <laughs> Are you tired of paying six-figure salaries to your American software programmers? Welcome to Tech India! State-of-the-art universities, highly skilled workers, and all of this for just 20% of an American salary. This is only possible in Tech India. Zero duties for importing computers. You don't even need to partner with any local company to set up an office here. Oh, and we even built a satellite so you can easily communicate between your North American headquarters and your Indian outsource office. Tech India! There are tax breaks available. Consult your local Indian accountant for more information. Join the Tech India Revolution. Tech India. Compaq has just done it. So has Texas Instruments. Even IBM has made a great comeback to our market. Everyone saves in Tech India. Call 1-600-TECH-INDIA now. Suddenly, India went from having less than 1,000 computers in 1978 to having over 80,000 in 1990. Local companies like Tata Computer Services or Hindustan Computers became outsourcing partners to big US firms like Hewlett Packard. And the government was more than happy. Even before many Western nations, India pioneered electronic voting machines, computerized banking, and even computerized railway bookings. And the whole world was looking at India as the go-to place for programmers. The computer revolution comes to India, sort of. Christian Science Monitor. Around the same time, the National Association of Software and Service Companies, NASCOM, was created. This is the trade association for Tech India. Since then, they have been the biggest lobbying power to liberalize India's software industry. And I know what you're going to say now. Come on, Josh, was it that easy? They just liberalized the market and international companies came running? Well. There was a small trick here. Remember those Indian IT universities? Remember all those scholars that didn't have IT companies to work at? Most of them got hired by Silicon Valley. They were very well trained back in India. So very soon, they started gaining more and more influence within the US companies. These Indian Americans helped the Indian government to craft legislation that met the exact needs of IT companies. And they also convinced their US managers to choose India instead of other countries. This explains, for example, why India was so keen to build those satellites to connect Indian offices with their American or British headquarters. Something that no one outside the IT industry would have thought of. And this created a virtuous cycle for the Indian IT industry. Even the financial crisis of the 90s, when the Indian currency devalued like crazy, served the interest of Tech India. Sure, the rest of the economy suffered from inflation, but the software companies became even more competitive because the Indian currency was so weak. So by the year 2000, the Indian software industry was already worth over $5 billion. But there is another turning point in our story, something that made this India within India even more important worldwide, and that was... 
the year 2000 problem. Those watching this video who are over 30 might remember this story. Do you remember the year 2000 problem? In India, they know it as the Y2K 2000 problem. Back then, many experts warned about the end of the world as we know it. But what was it all about? A Senate panel describes Y2K, the year 2000 computer bug, as a worldwide crisis and one of the most serious and potentially devastating events this nation has ever encountered. You see, early computers didn't have much storage capacity, so software developers used the last two digits to represent the year. For example, 60 for 1960 and so on. This means that 00 would represent both 1900 and 2000. So once the calendar clicked over to the 1st of January 2000, there could be a system breakdown. <laughs> At this point, you're probably wondering, but how could this software nightmare turn out to be a boon for India? Well, listen up. As we told you already, computerization had gained momentum in India only in the 1980s. Many of the computers were newer and did not face the Y2K bug. But developed countries such as Japan, South Korea, the US, the UK, Australia, etc. would be impacted. IT workers had the tedious task of trawling through millions of lines of code to correct the fault. And who was going to do this? Well, the city of Hyderabad in South India provided skilled IT workers for the task of debugging computers. India had the software manpower to race against time and solve this problem before the turn of the millennium. Boom time in India as the millennium bug bites. The Guardian. How did all of this come together? Well, there were a few different factors. Firstly, at the time, India was producing 100,000 new engineering graduates every year, and the salary of Indian programmers was about a sixth of what their counterparts in the US earned. But also, do you remember NASCOM? Tech India trade organization, they were ready to send all their sales force to any trade show, from Luxembourg to Oslo, from New York to San Jose. To give you an idea, in 1998, the millennium bug itself represented 40% of Tech India's income that year. In other words, the millennium bug helped India position itself as a leading software exporter. Over the next decade, in the 2000s, IT outsourcing expanded to high-end work such as R&D, architecture, and business integration. Global corporations have set up offshoring centers in India for business strategizing and end-to-end -end solutions. Business processing outsourcing, or BPOs, provide services related to customer interaction, medical transcription, insurance claim processing, and more. In the last decade, from 2009 to 2019, the IT sector in India has employed an additional 2 million people and created 10,000 new technology companies to become the $177 billion industry that it is today. But wait a minute, because this is where our fairy tale ends. Now, let's see the darker side of the story. A tale of two Indias. There is another thing India is infamous for, their caste system. Class matters in India, and IT is the best showcase for this. We told you the story of Tech India, a rich country within a poor one. So what happens to the rest of India? Surprisingly enough, whilst Indian programmers conquer the world, less than 10% of Indians have internet access. In rural India, only 3% have internet at home. For sure, working in IT in India is great. A software developer can start with a salary of just under 10,000 USD a year. This doesn't sound like a great wage by Western standards. But remember this is still India. According to expatistan.com, if you live in a city like Bangalore, you can rent a flat for less than $200 a month. So yes, IT workers have a good life. The so-called Bangalore Corridor alone has more than 67,000 companies. And that includes Indian behemoths such as Infosys, Mindtree, and Wipro. But entering Tech India requires requires a high level of education, proficiency in English, and social capital, which is unattainable for most Indians. Being a programmer is the ultimate Indian dream. It's not just about getting a good job in cities like Bangalore or Mumbai. It's also the prospect of being hired overseas. The whole world is willing to hire Indian workers. Japan is desperate for Indian techies, but will they bite ZDNet? German visa offer fails to tempt India's IT experts. The Guardian. In Silicon Valley, 50% of the migrant workers, those who take the famous H-1B visa, are Indian. The same happens in Seattle, where Amazon and Microsoft have their headquarters. But even there, the Indian caste system prevails. According to Equality Labs, US multinationals such as Facebook, Amazon, or Microsoft are discriminating against Indians from lower castes. But still, the dream for most Indians is to get one of those tech titles, to leave normal India and get into tech India. 
My Ticket Out, the Indian village where every family has an engineer, the Guardian. For example, in the village of Patwatoli in northern India, the community has come together to provide resources and facilities so kids can aspire to study in one of those Indian universities. Parents put together their life savings and take out loans to provide their children tutoring to clear the entrance exams. In 2017 alone, 20 students from this village got accepted into one of these Indian technological universities. But still, lower castes made up only 9% of the total faculty at the IITs. So what happens in the rest of India? Why aren't they growing as much as tech India? The truth is that aside from computers, India is still a deeply protectionist country and the paradise of bureaucracy. According to the Ease of Doing Business Index, India ranks next to Saudi Arabia or Ukraine. For example, every product has a different tax. Sometimes even different models of the same product have a different VAT tax. And there are market barriers even within the country. If you pass between two Indian states, you will find long lines of trucks with merchandise. This is because each of them has to go through internal customs control and they have to do it several times whilst crossing the country. And what about tariffs? Whilst computers are duty free, the rest of the products, from pharmaceuticals to clothes, have some of the world's highest tariffs. And Narendra Modi's far right wing government is not making things easier. In fact, the opposite is true. India plans extra tariffs, trade barriers on 300 imported products, Reuters. In the last two years, Amazon and Walmart have become the target of Narendra Modi's anger. Just like the Gandhis did with IBM, Modi is making the situation harder and harder for these companies. They are even debating whether to ban e-commerce entirely from the Indian market. At the time of making this video, this is what is happening in India. Confederation of All India Traders wants seven day ban on Amazon for violating country of origin rule. Business today. So now the question is, why doesn't India just extend the rules for the software industry to the rest of the economy? Or maybe this IT boom is a bubble that is bound to burst. Tell us your thoughts in the comments. So I really hope you've enjoyed this video. Please hit like if you did and don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos. Don't forget to check out our friends at the Reconsider Media podcast. They provided the vocals in this episode that were not mine. And also this channel is possible because of Patreon and our patrons on the platform. Please consider joining them and supporting our mission of providing independent political coverage. And as always, I'll see you in the next video. And if you want to learn more about politics and hear even more of my lovely voice, you can join us at Reconsider Media. We have a podcast at reconsidermedia.com slash podcast. See you there.